large section. Okay. There's kind of a large section here about the role of ADRC, so I'm not going to read that to you folks, but it, you know, I, I kind of put in um, there's a couple of different acronyms in there, and I put in what those things stand for. But I just wanted you guys to have that for your information, what our role is. And then the main thing I wanted to kind of go over is our 15 core services. So these are the 15 specific things that we are charged by the state of Wisconsin through our scope of services to provide to Dunn County. So the first thing is marketing, outreach, and public education. So a big focus of the state is to try to get information out there to consumers or to folks of what the ADRC is, what we do, what services we can provide that we're kind of the central point of intake for folks that are having questions about care in the community, what services they may be eligible for and that sort of thing. Also, when we're doing outreach type events, we also just provide information on community resources. Oftentimes, like for example, we just did a, um, we had a booth at the farmer's market and yes, we talked about the ADRC, but we were also able to answer questions directly if people had specific questions about services that were available. Information and assistance. So that's a, a huge part of what we do. Our three social workers that are specific ADRC social workers, their, their title is actually um, information and assistance social workers. Um, one of them at least is in the office um, Monday through Friday, 8 to 4.30, and they're, they're called our intake or our access social workers. So they're there for any folks who just walk in and need information assistance, people who call, people who email. There's always a person available Monday through Friday to do that. And they're providing information and assistance in a variety of ways. Sometimes people are calling and they just need information on home care agencies that might be available. Sometimes it's a, it's a child that's saying, oh my gosh, I'm, my mom is having all these different issues and they really need somebody to talk through those situations. And there might be a variety of things that we can offer to those folks. But some calls are very simple and it's a you know, pretty direct question and answer. Some are much more complex and there's kind of a, a variety of options we can afford, you know, uh, give to those folks. The long-term care options counseling. So if somebody is, um, you know, the, the INA workers, which is what we call the information and assistance workers, shorthand, um, if they are talking to somebody and they realize that that person may be eligible for what is called a long-term care program in the state of Wisconsin, um, the long-term care programs, one is called IRIS, which is a program that people um, who are kind of able to self-direct um, they're able to kind of manage their own funds. They're able to kind of manage their own care. IRIS is kind of a program that's specifically designed for those types of folks. And one is called family care, where there's more um, of a managed care situation. So if folks have heard of agencies called Inclusa, um, they fall under that family care gap where folks um, are working with a care manager and usually an RN as well that help them come up with a plan to keep them in um, as safe an environment as possible and in the least restrictive um, setting as possible. But the long-term care, um, so the INA workers are specially trained to do a couple of things. They're specially trained to do what's called the long-term care functional screening. Everybody who becomes eligible for a publicly funded long-term care program has to go through a screening with an INA worker. Um, and it's you, typically about probably 95% of the time the INA worker is actually meeting the person in their home. If the person wants, you know, a caregiver or a loved one to be present, that's certainly okay. Um, and they're going through a, quite an extensive screening tool with them that asks them all sorts of questions, basically about how they function in their home. Do they need help with um, their activities of daily living, like bathing? Do they need help with meal preparation? Do they have memory issues? There's all sorts of things that, that, are, that go into that screening. And the state takes those screenings very, very seriously. Um, I actually feel like some of our, our INA workers are some of the most highly trained screeners of all social workers that we have. They have to take a test every other year um, related to their, their screening abilities. And if they don't pass, they are at risk of losing their job. Um, it's, they take it very seriously. Then throughout the year, there's additional trainings um, that they go through on a more, a less formal basis. It's not a test, but it's ongoing testing to make sure that 
the way they would score a person in terms of what their needs are match up with what the state expectations are. So um, there's a lot, like I said, that screen is very important and that helps somebody become eligible for one of those programs, either the IRIS or the family care program. Um, dementia related services and supports. So every county is required now to have at least a half time dementia care specialist. Our dementia care specialist, her name is Carla, and she's actually shared, she's half time in Dunn County and half time in Chippewa County. And we partnered with Chippewa County like that because we both recognize that it's much easier to recruit and retain a quality person if you can offer a full time job with benefits. Um, rather than just a half-time job, um, you tend to see a lot of people moving from um, position to position when they're when they're only uh, in a half-time position. So, so Carla works both with us in Dunn County and in Chippewa County, half-time basis for both. Pre-admission, and I'm sorry, with dementia-related services and supports, the other thing that we have to have certified memory screeners. That's another service that we're required to provide as memory screens for folks that are looking for that. Pre-admission consultation and assistance with resident transition. So oftentimes that might be something, um, someone who's looking to move into an assisted living or a nursing home, we can help them with that process. Someone is moving from a nursing home into the community, they need assistance with that process. A big piece, unfortunately, a bigger piece um, for many counties that have, has come up in recent years is facility closures nursing homes and assisted living that close, we have to take a very active role in meeting the residents and making sure that their, their questions are answered, that they have services that they need, and that they end up in a safe setting afterwards. Thankfully, that has not happened in recent years in Dunn County, but it's becoming much more of, of a statewide issue, which is never a good thing. Um, elder benefits counseling, we are, we are required to have an elder benefits specialist our EB, or we call it the EBS. Um, Bethany Schneider is our elder benefits specialist in Dunn County. And she does a lot of work with folks who are applying for Medicare or who are going through the Medicare open enrollment um, process and are interested in information and learning more about what their options are and what would be good fits for them. Um, the disability benefits <coughs> counseling, we're required to have a disability benefits specialist. The elder benefit specialist works with everyone who's 60 years and up. The disability benefit specialist works with people who are 18 to 59. Um, and our DBS, it, her name's Lisa Schuler, and she does a lot of work with helping people become eligible for um, Social Security disability, um, helping them get onto Medicaid programs, that sort of thing. Both of those women are very busy, very busy schedules. Um, number eight, access to publicly funded long-term care programs and services. So again, I kind of jumped to the gun. That was um, the functional screening that I was talking about. Um, going through that functional screen process is how people get access to those, those long-term care programs. Access to other public and private programs and benefits. So that can, that can be a variety of different things. Um, you know, advising people, giving them information on how to become eligible for Medicaid. If someone is a veteran, connecting them up with the veteran service office. Sometimes, you know, try and get them connected with information on their own private insurance that they might have and that they're having a hard time getting information about. Access to emergency or crisis intervention specialists. So we, our, our workers in the ADRC have to understand, be able to identify a crisis and know when emergency services have to be engaged. So either for someone's having a medical emergency, someone's having a mental health emergency, you know, sometimes folks um, call any number they, they can find. It might not be appropriate that it's ADRC, but we're the people they reach. And so we, you know, we have um, policies and procedures in place to get folks to the right EMS um, personnel if necessary. Emergency preparedness and response. So we have to have a plan for how we would partner with um, emergency management services and what our role would be in assisting if we had like a countywide um, emergency, a tornado went through. ADRCs are actually charged with being part of that response. And we have to um, also be willing to participate in any sort of training. Dunn County in general has an overall emergency services plan for those sorts of things and the ADRC has a role in that. 
um, access to adult protective services. So adult protective services is the system in which people um, report suspected abuse, neglect, um, financial abuse, those sorts of things for, for adults. So um, adults 18 to 59 who are, are listed as vulnerable for whatever reason, they have some sort of disability, whether that be um, physical, cognitive, uh, mental health related, or elders 60 years and older. So our, the way our system here in Dunn County is our INA workers, the ones who are answering the telephone calls coming in, they actually take the initial APS reports, the Adult Protective Service reports, and I actually supervise both programs. So I supervise the ADRC and APS. And ADRC and APS were housed in the same hallway. So we really work hand in hand. And our ADRC staff know very intimately how to access APS and how to make reports um, because they're the ones that are taking the reports from the public. But there are times that our INA workers have to actually make a report because they may be working with someone and they go to a home visit and they find that it's a very unsafe um, situation and, and the person needs some intervention there. Transitional services for students and youth. So we do have one lead worker who specifically works with um, young adults who are 17 and a half or older that will need continuing services as an adult. So the services that they're provided as a child are going to end because they're going to become an adult, but you know, perhaps they have a developmental disability that is not something that just goes away because you turn 18. So Amy White is our, our lead worker for that. She gets a lot of referrals from our children and families department, also from up the school districts. She has good relationships with a lot of the guidance counselors, so they know to call her when somebody's kind of approaching that age um, that they will need to kind of transition from the children's services side to the adult services side. So there's no gap in service there. Um, another thing that we're charged with is helping um, consumers understand their rights and responsibilities and advocating for them. For example, we had a call last week where someone was very unhappy with the family care program that they had chosen. They were unhappy with their services and the timeliness. So we helped them understand you know, the formal process for making agreements with that agency, things like that. Interestingly, the ADRCs are actually, by our scope of services, charged with um, doing lobbying, which is, you know, lobbying is kind of one of those things that in general DHS, I don't think we're ever prevented from doing lobbying, but it's very unusual um, for like a behavioral health or families, you know, services, that sort of thing to actually do lobbying. Part of the ADRC scope of services is we are supposed to be part of lobbying for services um, for our target population. So we, um, we are a member of what's called GWAR, which is the Greater Wisconsin Area Aging Program. They actually employ a lobbyist. She keeps all of us ADRCs um, informed of different, um, different actions that are being brought in front of our state legislature and asks us to do various ways to contact email, telephone, things that if, if we're in, in support or not in support of a particular action. So we're very lucky we kind of have a point person who keeps us updated, but then it's the responsibility of us at the ADRCs to follow through with doing that. And then community needs um, identification. So part of what we do is try to identify unmet needs. So for example, um, the community health worker position working with the Hmong population was as a result of realizing that we probably are not doing the best job we can in terms of meeting the needs of that popula population. Um, but you know that can take a, a variety of ways in different communities based on what the different community needs are. The second page, there are three other allowable services. Those are not required, but they are allowed. Um, health promotion, prevention, and early intervention. So some of the programs that really strongly go along with this, um, if any of you have heard of or participated in like the Strong Bones program or the Walk with Ease program, those are considered health promotion. Um, try to you know promote health, prevent problems in the future, those sorts of things. We can do short-term service coordination. 
So the relationship that an INA worker has with somebody that they're working with to try to get them on those long-term care programs is not really designed to be a case management or a long-term um, relationship. It's supposed to be, you know, to get them the services they need and then essentially the relationship ends. Um, but there, there are some exceptions that, you know, for whatever reason, someone may have a delay in getting onto one of those programs and they really need some service coordination. We are allowed to do that on a limited basis. It's supposed to be 90 days or less. There is some flexibility with those timelines, but again, that's not our primary focus, but we are allowed to do that. And then other um, services as approved by the State Department of Human Services. So again, like the community health worker position, that was actually designed by the state as a pilot project. So they essentially had you know, approved um, ABRCs working with that program as a pilot. Um, if an ADRC came up with a novel idea of their own, they would have to go through that process um, with the State Department of Human Services to get permission to provide that type of service. And then the next thing, the governing board rule, roles. So there really are three roles that are outlined in our scope of services. Um, the first is to provide strategic direction to the ADRC to ensure fidelity to the ADRC mission. So again, I think you folks are bringing us ideas or things that you're observing in the community um, as, I, as talking points for us to discuss and then for us to figure out if some of those might fit in with the mission of what the ADRC does um, is certainly something that I think would be a good use of our time. So yeah. this, this section, the governing board, is that us? That's you, yes. Because, I should have said that. We are elsewhere always referred to in this county as an advisory. Yes, right. technically so. in scope of services as listed as governing board, it is considered advisor in all ADRCs. Again, they, the, the scope of services lists it as governing board, but it is not a um, formal decision-making board in any county. Um, the second thing they point out is advocating for older adults and adults with physical or intellectual disabilities in our service area. So again, our service area is Dunn County, um, charging you with advocating for services for folks that meet our, our criteria. And then finally, representing and promoting the ADRC and our services to the community. So we kind of look at you as ambassadors for the ADRC. If you're going out to community meetings and you hear people who, or you're just meeting with friends, you know, whatever the case may be, and people bring things up about needing services or wanting information to really point them into the, the direction of the ADRC and letting them know that we're here and we're here to help. Um, there are just a couple I thought of interesting there are some rules about how our governing board, the makeup, at least one fourth of our members have to be older adults, adults with a physical disability and adults with an intellectual disability or family members who are, who are representing them um, and reflective of our target population. Um, representatives of groups receiving limited services may be representative, but don't count towards that one fourth. And a governing board member can only represent one um, population. So for example, if you had someone who um, was a, considered an older adult, but also had um, a developmental disability, they would only fit, you, you would choose one or the other in terms of what, they're represent, what they were representing. And I do know that our state, um, the person from Guar who is kind of our, our go-to person every year, she goes over with me the list and what category folks fit in so that she can report back to the state that our, our board um, meets those requirements. So, any questions on any of that information? It's a lot, I'm sorry, it really is a lot. <laughs> and, it, and it actually like, I brought the whole scope of services because it's, you know, what is it here? this much. Um, and so I, I, I got it down to about a page and a half, the best I could, <laughs> uh, but it is actually much, you know, much more in depth than that. Charlotte, yeah. What about the funding? Does this increase, decrease? So where's the funding from? The funding is primarily from the state, but there is a county, there's a requirement with the grant that there's a county match for a portion of the funding. Mm -hmm. Chris, and actually Charlotte, if you don't mind, can I bring that to the next meeting? Because Chris had put together um, some time ago that, and I believe 
it was gone over even before my time, but a really good little handout on how the funding works for AERC. And I think that that would be best. I don't want to fumble through the, the but didn't we learn last time that someone had lost their position and they were going out into people's homes? Not with the ADRC. We haven't had anyone leave our position. But no, I, it was due to funding, well, lack of funding by the uh, county minister. Can you think of anything, Paul, that would be another department? Keep going on this, and that piece of it is home care. Yeah. Oh, oh yes. 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 So that was some. That was how how many years ago was that, Lena? Now that twenty nineteen. Yes. So in twenty nineteen, that and home care was a whole separate agency, mm -hmm. Charlotte. That was not is not affiliated with the ADRC actually, oh, and okay. the county board made the decision to close that program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, it didn't it didn't filter underneath ADRC. Well, I think that's a really good example, though, of um, advocacy. So when Tracy talks about what the INA does, people might come and say, in order to stay in my home, I need home care, right? Mm -hmm. And now with Dunn County closing the home care, that's one less option for people in the county mm -hmm. to be able to get those services. And um, there's private organizations that do that. But as you're hearing things out mm -hmm. in the community, that there's a need for this. It may be your role to advocate that for that by coming back here and saying, we're hearing that there is not enough providers. You know, is there something that can be done about that? Now the ADRC doesn't isn't going to create home care, right? That's not their role to create that, but it is their role to be a voice to have for services. So you hearing that can then come back and you know, and if they have the ability to then you know, let people know or to be able to talk about that with somebody, then that's a good thing to, to share. Uh, I remember Larry saying that oh, it's a shame that these were elderly people who had always paid their taxes, but now when they needed some help, it wasn't there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they looked toward pri other private, not county yeah. programs, yeah. but, but uh, private oh, so, yeah. so a lot, a lot of counties did have done this. They closed theirs their um, home care because um, it's really hard to make money in the home care business. And mm -hmm. so um, counties lose money usually and have to have tax levy in that program. And it's a way for the counties to save some funding with that tax levy. And there are private entities that do do home care. We know though that when home care is closed in counties that the residents really then struggle to find home care. So it is, you know, something that we've seen in a lot of counties. So um, it's challenging, but a lot of counties have gone out of that business because um, there's private entities that do that. Wasn't there also a cut in the state funding under a certain governor? Mm -hmm. uh, there could have been. Because uh, there's a large concern over no fair that used to come into homes and do health care and after he had quashed a lot of things, they left like 1,500 people go up there. Okay. Yeah, fun, I mean, fun funding is always a challenge, and different administrations certainly make different decisions that affect all of us. So, um, Paul and I weren't here in 2019. I mean, I, I was here, but in a different department and not in a decision making capacity when the county made decisions regarding home care. I do know it was a long process for them to, to make the decision to close. And a difficult one, um, but like Paula said, yeah, a lot, a lot of funds. And you know, in general, many programs in healthcare um, are probably un underfunded. Um, so it's a it's a tough business. So okay, so like the visiting angels, I don't mm -hmm. even know if they're out there anymore. Yes. So how do you get a list of those? Because the senior center really needs to know who is actually still doing that. Well, here's the scoop. So we have a list, and actually I, I was going to meet with Marky because uh, she brought up some of our lists, for example. We keep a list, and we send folk, this with folks when they call for information. It is incredibly challenging to keep this updated, mm -hmm. um, simply because things change all the time for agencies, for facilities. Marvie was specifically looking for a list of specific um, facilities that provide memory care services because she helps us with a memory care support group that she runs. 
and we thought our list was up to date. Well, come to find out, no, it wasn't. Um, home care agencies open and shut quite often. So we, we do our best. We have a list. All ADRCs have a list for their particular county of what, um, what is available, what services serve those counties. So certainly you can refer people to call us, but we always do kind of have the caveat. This was current when we printed this list. Um, it is possible that things have changed because, and oftentimes, you know, visiting angels is, um, is open and operating, but they may be at capacity for being able to take new clients. So they have to put people on a waiting list simply because they don't have the staff. So it does end up being a little bit of work for folks sometimes to find those services and put themselves on waiting lists. And again, it's kind of scary that, you know, there's a number of places that um, we we find out after the fact or very with very short notice that they're closing services. At the senior center, you guys, ADRC is like at the top of our list of Good. referral numbers for any number of right. things. And we do our best and we really reach out to our folks when they ask to be asked, added to our resource list. Please keep us updated if there's a change, if you don't provide these services anymore. Unfortunately, I think with staffing issues and that sort of thing, we may have talked to somebody that was in a position three workers ago, but you know, and, and, and it's just too much for them to call all these different places that they may have put their name out there to let us know. We do do our best when we have interns. Sometimes it's, you know, something that we ask them to call every single person on the list just to make sure it's, it's accurate. Um, that's always a good in social work intern project. Um, but again, we do have lists, Sherry, so you can always refer people to okay. us. And we do try to keep it as updated as possible. So, but it also means probably also knowing what's in uh, surrounding counties mm -hmm. because we don't have some of the services or don't or they're at capacity, right? And uh, and so knowing what's available in St. Croix and and uh, Eau Claire and something is is also important. And it is. I will say it is challenging because it truly, like if people, for example, are looking for memory care placement, I know this even from my previous work, it's it's a job to try to find a, a, a place that might be able to accept them. And, it, and many times people are having to branch out on the area that they'll look at. Maybe it's not gonna be Dunn County, maybe it's gonna have to be Eau Claire County and, and we are on a waiting list. Um, and it's kind of hard to tell people, well, you know, call Eau Claire County ADRC for their list call. What is nice, although it's not, it's not currently happening at the moment, but the state is working on it. The state is going to be working on an overall state database of resources available um, for ADRCs. They have not given us a timeline when this will be available, um, but it will be, what will happen when the database is available is all ADRCs will have, we will have the same website and folks will be able to go to a drop down box and choose the county or counties that they're interested in looking for particular services. And it will bring up the most current um, list available for those counties and those particular types of services. So it's interesting, the state has asked us as county ADRC managers not to invest a lot of time or money in updating our current websites, just kind of keeping it at the status quo, but don't be investing money on developing some beautiful new website because soon we'll have this, the website. And then at that point, that will probably become part of our, our scope of services that we will have to link with that, um, that website, which honestly, I think it makes a lot of sense. That will be a central point and you can get all the information you need. Many times folks, again, they're not just looking in one particular county. They might be looking in a whole region just to see what is available anywhere within driving distance. Um, and that'll be much helpful. And it's helpful for the local level too, because um, it is, like I said, it is a challenge for us to try to keep all of this updated, just even for our, our own county. But the state is actually gonna have staff members specifically dedicated to doing this and the IT with it. And so they've assured us that they will have some sort of system for outreach in terms of contacting agencies that are on the resource list to be sure that things are still current. So that I thought that that was a really helpful and good thing. I have a couple questions. Sure. Uh, one is um, some of these programs are income based. 
Sure. And yep. some are not. Yep. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. So that if you're dealing with uh, somebody that is coming in in INA, that if they're going through a screening, mm -hmm. part of the screening would be, well, are they going to be eligible for bait programs based on income? Correct. Or they may be based on it because of, uh, and, and so, so let's say that someone doesn't meet the income guidelines, mm -hmm. but needs help. Uh, are how do you um, you don't do private case management? Correct. So does anybody? I mean, that would be something that would be nice to have in this list of people of people that do private case management. So you would man, you would find out. They're not income based for the programs, but they have basic needs. They have some real needs. Who's going to help manage that? And uh, so that would be nice to have a list of private case managers in the area that or agencies that do private case management. So that's a very interesting point, Marty. And actually, this came up in another conversation I had a few months ago. As far as anyone knows in this region for eight years, there are no private case management. Um, businesses or entities at the moment. Um, I don't know if that was more common at one point because the question came up where somebody was asking. Interestingly, again, the ADRC has let us know some of the changes that they're looking at for scope of services coming into 2023. So what, you know, the changes, very few changes, but one of them actually was that they would allow people to privately pay for the case management services through the long-term care um, programs with the state. Mm -hmm. So I think that that came up as a point of discussion that there was not an option for people, you know, especially like, let's say somebody who has enough funding to pay for their own services, but let's say they don't have any family nearby. We get calls on a regular basis, the children are living in California, the parents are here. They wanna make sure that they have um, they have services, but they're not physically present to do some of that stuff. In the past, the only way that people got um, what could be eligible for like the inclusive family care type programs was if they met the financial requirements of those programs. The state hasn't said for sure, but they did share verbiage with us that showed that they were going to be allowing for folks to privately pay for those case management services. So yes, I don't know for sure. They haven't released the full um, the actual document for 2023 yet. I believe that doesn't come out until the end of this year, um, but that was widely supported by ADRC managers to allow that option. Well, I, th I think that's something that's that's probably needed. Mm -hmm. You know, in a community like this, I mean, you can get people within your friends and your churches or whatever it is, but they're not going to do the kind of assessments and, the, right. and be able to really uh, help develop the services that are needed. Mm -hmm. And uh, Okay, and the other thing had to do with lobbying. What about the Hatch Act and the fact that you can't advocate for something in your program? I mean, in your, and you're not allowed to, I mean, you said that we could advocate, you, you could advocate. Do you expect us as volunteers in the community who aren't employed by the, by the, to, to be the advocates or do you, uh, can you as a, um, employee advocate for your own programs because I thought that was kind of illegal to do that. Right. Let me just read exactly what it says in our terms of service. It's very brief. It says ADRCs will advocate on behalf of the individuals and groups who comprise their target populations when needed services are not being adequately provided within the service delivery system. It's very, okay. very, very kind of not non-specific is probably you know that's probably specifically why it's well but what they're doing is saying that you can advocate for the people that you serve Correct. not advocating for your jobs yes exactly. that's, that's i'm the, sorry i i probably didn't say that very clearly Mark. yes no Mark. but no 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 yes. that's i'm just trying to clarify it mm -hmm. so that it fits into the hatch act yeah but doesn't up, but doesn't but allows you to advocate for um our consumers. Our concerns. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we can advocate for our consumers, not for ourselves or our for right. our own yeah, agency or that sort of thing. Yeah. I should have been more clear about. Oh that. no, no, no. I yeah. think that clarified. Yep. Yeah. But I wouldn't expect you. I mean, like I said, I wouldn't expect you guys, you folks, to be doing 
um, lobbying unless you chose to do so because as private systems, of course, you can lobby for you know whatever you choose to lobby for. But I wouldn't expect you to do that on behalf of the ADRC unless you wanted to. I mean, like again, the you know the three core things: provide us with direction, um, advocate for older adults, and represent us in the community and provide information to folks in the community that might need our services. This is helpful. Yeah. I, I found yeah. this. Good. I I I. I I think it's wonderful that you had it printed out and you did an excellent Oh, presentation. thank you. Well, you know, when the, when, with the discussion last month, I, so many points I was thinking, yes, that's right. We really should talk about that. And I'm not sure about that either. So whenever those sorts of things come into my mind, I'm like, that should really be probably a, a topic of discussion for the next month. Next, um, at our next meeting, Charlotte, I will bring that information on how the ADRC is funded. Because like I said, I know that I have access to a really nice, um, description and it's it's actually there are some com complexities to how it all works um, so I don't want to answer that now but I'll bring that for the next meeting and that'll be a good topic of conversation then. I have a, a topic too that I sure. would appreciate some information on I've heard from uh, at least two three people that they're having more problems finding nursing homes and, and nursing homes nursing homes and there's a real issue with that I think it's getting worse mm -hmm. Nursing homes. They're finding, finding, finding place, finding spots available in nursing homes. We certainly can talk about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we hear that all the time. Folks are sometimes really staying, having to stay. Like, if somebody's needing a short-term rehab stay, they're having what to stay in hospital much longer. What we can tell them to besides calling you, right? Uh, Let. I'll put that on the agenda for next time if that's okay, because that might have give me a little bit of time to, to kind of gather some information about that. that. That brings me to a question that I have. I know that um, I asked Chris, you know, how do you bring topics here? You know, how, how do you have a voice? Because it's not really on the agenda at all. And she said it's kind of in the public comments that if you want to make a statement or something, you can do that during the public comment section. But my question was, would you prefer to have a section in here that um, is like a statement for advocating or topics that you want to advocate within these roles, right? Because now you have the scope of like what we're doing. So, you know, it wouldn't make sense that you would ever um, advocate for children and families um, foster care, right? <laughs> because it's not within the scope of service of the roles, but now that you kind of have this, if there's things that you want to bring forward and we have an agenda item for that, that would give you the, the opportunity then to discuss things like the nursing home or you know those types of things. So is that something that you would find helpful or do you want to keep it underneath the public comments? I actually thought public comments meant that somebody from outside would right. come in and make a comment. I didn't that's, know it was one of them. That's typically what it is. So that but that's what she said that you know that you guys so, have done that. So, I mean, we're, we're kind of the, the, the voice of the community mm -hmm. out there. We're in touch with different people in the community, and we see concerns that people might, and I think it's important that, that we make you aware, the county aware of some of the concerns that we've had, or uh, we've seen out in the community. Um, yeah, I agree, and that's that will give you that agenda item to do that. Without that, we're kind of not following the rules of the agenda. <laughs> what I'll help I'll, you get. Okay, I'll we'll get we'll that. add a standing kind of a standing um mm -hmm. a standing item on the agenda. And speaking of that, Des, I think last month you mentioned that you were sending okay. out a survey to Menominee, yeah. Colfax, Boysville. Housing? Oh, yes. the housing. Yep. The, I have not seen anything in Colfax at all, and I talked to a couple people. They said, "Well, if they can't afford it, they don't do." It. And okay. that wasn't the ADRC specifically. It was the was county. We did a, a housing study, and um, I'm not. Sure. Is there a library in Colfax? Yep. That's where they got put then, because it was in the libraries. It's one tenth of the people. Yep. Yeah. And unfortunately, Colfax had that property. I used to live in Colfax. They had the properties up there that are going to give away. Well, I know one person's paying $1,800 a year in taxes. And his, he bought the house for $237. Now, Charlotte Properties just bought the trailer park. You're going to have an income of $2,500. <coughs> no, mm -hmm. 
And the, when I was living there, it was two hundred and thirty-five dollars. It's now seven hundred and fifty dollars. I have a, a copy of the housing survey in my office, so after this, I will go get it for you. I gotta leave right after. There was an article in the Dunn County News right. about it. Yeah. And it's been out electronically in those things. Yeah. So I know. Now one thing, Colfax, I'll just be very upfront. Colfax has never been itself like they've been as part of the community, even though Gary stands on committees and everything. They just sort of wash their hands and now make the results. I do know Chris had mentioned too about doing those kinds of public surveys. That's always a challenge of both the best way to, to try to reach as many people as possible. So I know it's always a challenge for them. To but I think you'd contact the school administration. It would be a better resource because hmm. they're dealing with this issue on a regular basis. So what administration? Uh, school. Oh, school. And what issue are they? Um, well, they, they deal with all sorts of housing. Okay. You know, the kids and well, we don't have any uh, people that don't have homes. Well, they had 45 or 50 mm -hmm. families mm -hmm. that were homeless in Colfax. In Colfax. That were living with somebody else or in the park or sure. and paula would you be able to pass that on to the folks that did that survey just for sure. future reference because the library only gets so tight people on sure the school district that has a bigger reach yes mm -hmm. okay. for sure that can be done and we could also the, send it out as an email to parents oh yeah the school district yeah, yeah. Sure. any other questions on this little guide that i that we just went over that's all right. I'll just jump right into the community health worker activities report. I just wanted to give one more update. I probably won't do. Oh, thank you. Um, I probably won't do this um, each meeting now. Maybe I'll just do it, you know, maybe in six months' time. But community health worker, that was the grant that we got the pilot project specifically to work with the Hmong community. Last time, I think I just reported that Alita Yang, we had hired her. Um, she had had a short maternity leave and was back. And I am very pleased with some of the work that she's now been doing. Um, we do, she, she organized our stands at the farmer's market, which was a great outreach event for all of us, not just for um, reaching folks in the Hmong community, but as anyone who goes to the farmer's market knows a, a lot of vendors at the, um, at the farmer's market are Hmong descent and you know quite a few patrons are as well. So that was a great, that was her idea and it was really a great one. She, the Hmong Friendship Group had their first meeting. I know it was kind of a small attempt the first time, but again, just like many of our group meetings, I think they're going to start small and grow as people become more comfortable with kind of having those group meetings. Um, I have since attended one of their board meetings and, you know, so that is um, regenerating and that was kind of one of her, her major products. And she also has been taking referrals from some of our partners in the community, um, like actually Bridge to Hope contacted her, the hospitals, um, the local hospital and Marshfield Clinic have contacted her. Um, I'm trying to think, Stepping Stones has contacted her. So she, her name is getting out there as a contact specifically for folks in the Hmong community that just need um, probably a little bit more handholding and a little bit more assistance with walking through the steps of accessing services, which is exactly what those positions are designed to do. So very happy with the progress. Um, the state folks who are overseeing that grant, we meet with them um, at least monthly. Alita meets actually weekly with the other community health workers. Um, and they're very, very pleased with our progress and the different projects that they have been working on. It's very clear to me that the state is very interested in this model and would hope to expand it. They're already working on, um, I don't know if you'd call it the arguments, but the, um, the information they want to provide to the federal government um, as to why this type of funding should continue. So, you know, we're hopeful, but of course we never know how, how things go with funding. Yes. So it seems like um, the continuation possibilities of that grant. Mm -hmm. Is that something that might be useful for any of us to take the advocacy role? Cool. That's an excellent question. And actually, if you don't mind, I will just ask um, our the person we work with at the state. She's specifically working on these sorts of grants. She's wonderful. Her name is Allison mm -hmm. Molitor. So I will ask her, and I will just say that that question came from this group, of wondering if there was like a letter of support or you know something that you could provide. And I will I will report back. Okay. Um, Yes. A, it's a personal cause. Yeah. It's all raw, raw about. So, I just, just want to ask. 
I will I will report back at the next meeting. Um, I'll chat with Allison about that and see if there's anything she needs. She's kind of the point person who is, is working with all the counties and will be the person who um, authors the report based on the whole Wisconsin project to submit back to the federal government in hopes to continue that funding. So um, she may not have thought of letters of support, but I bet you she'll love the idea. So, um, so I'll let you know what she says. Thank you, Susan. Sure. Or maybe she'll say, oh, that's a death wish, she'll do that. Well, I think mean, she's this, um, Allison is very, very experienced in um, grants, uh, getting grants from at the federal level. So I, whatever she suggests, suggests, I will know will be good advice, but I will offer that and say that this group um, made the offer that you'd be willing to do that um, on our behalf. So that was all I had to say about that. <laughs> And then um, we didn't have any consideration of actions to be taken to the committee, so that moves us to adjournment. We have a motion to adjourn. Okay. And a second. Thank you. And all in favor say aye. Aye. And those opposed, same sign. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Could I just offer this is post meeting, so it doesn't have to be in front of on the next time you uh, print this agenda, maybe you could strike the word basement in the first paragraph. Yeah, yep. just put the room. Yeah, so I don't.